searching for the answer. Wish I could take your tears and replace them with laughter. Long live Palestine. While we listen to tunes made by ignorant fools Israel blocked the UN from delivering food They bring in the troops and you won't even glimpse at the news They make money off the products that we're quick to consume And it's not simply a question of different views Forget emotions, this is facts, what I spit is the truth Makes no difference if you're a Christian or if you're a Jew They're just people living in different conditions to you They still die when you bomb their schools, mosques and hospitals It's not because of rockets, please God, can you stop this all? I'm not related to the strangers on the team TV, but I relate, cause those strangers could have been me Words could never ever explain the raw tragedy no. It's not a war, they're just murdering more rapidly And we're automatically supporting pure savagery Imagine how you feel if this was your family Palestine remains in my heart forever We stand for peace, times of war We shan't surrender, remember It didn't start in this dark December Every coin is a bullet if you're Marks and Spencer And when you're sipping Coca-Cola That's another pistol in the holster of them soulless soldiers You say you know about the Zionist lobby But you put money in their pocket when you're buying their coffee Talking about revolution sitting in Starbucks The fact is, that's the type of thinking I can't trust Let alone even start to respect before you talk Learn the meaning of that scarf on your neck Forget Nestle, forget Obama Promise Israel 30 billion over the next decade They're trigger happy and they're crazy Think about that when you're putting Huggies nappies on your baby This is not just a war over stolen land Why do you think little boys are throwing stones at tanks? And we'll never really know how many people are dead They drop bombs on innocent girls while they sleep in their bed Don't get offended by facts, just try and listen Nothing is more anti-Semitic than Zionism So please don't bring bad vibes when you speak to me There's plenty of rabbis that agree with me It's your choice what you do with this message Don't get it confused, I view this from a human perspective How many more resolutions have to be violated? How many, How many more children have to be annihilated? Israel is a terror state, they're terrorists that terrorize I testify my television, televise and telling lies This is not a war, it is systematic change Genocide, but whatever they try, Palestine will never die. Free my people, walk with Palestine. We will never let you go. Sing it with me now. Free, free Palestine. 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 Palestine, Ramallah, West Bank, Gaza. This is for the child that is searching for an answer Wish I could take your tears and replace them with laughter Long live Palestine, long live Gaza Palestine, Ramallah, West Bank, Gaza This is for the child that is searching for an answer Wish I could take your tears and replace them with laughter Long live Palestine, long live Gaza Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to get started. Uh, so my name is Onya Sanu Chatoye. I will be your MC tonight. This is the fourth webinar in our Pan-Africanism and Anti-Zionism webinar series. We've been here every Tuesday evening, along with a lot of y'all, uh, in the month of January, talking about the need to be anti-Zionist, talking about the need to be in solidarity with the Palestine liberation struggle, talking about how the Zionist movement is a tool of imperialism that is a threat to not just Palestinian people, but to African people and to all forces fighting for justice on this planet. And so we are wrapping it up tonight with a conversation about why we could never, ever, ever conflate the religion of Judaism and the imperialist white supremacist movement of Zionism. But before I get into that conversation, I just want to say, uh, give a little bit of background about myself for folks who are joining for the first time. 
My name is Onyasanmu Chatoye. Like I said, I am a cadre with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. I'm also an editor with Hood Communist and uh, on the National Coordinating Committee of the Vencinamos Brigade, which is a Kiba Solidarity delegation. All struggles are connected. The APRP, along with the South Florida Coalition for Palestine, All Adwa Right to Return Coalition, the Black Alliance for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Hook Communist Blog are the organizers and sponsors of this webinar series. And the reason why we did this is because we believe and understand that all African people fighting for the liberation of our land, our labor, and our people must be anti-Zionist. The Pan-African movement has a long and principled history of struggle against Zionism and side by side with Palestinian comrades. And we want to live up to that legacy and carry it forward. The APRP as an organization has been anti-Zionist for the entirety of our existence because we are clear on what Zion is and that is a white supremacist, imperialist ideology. We are so grateful and humble to see the mass mobilizations happening in support of Palestine all over the world, people all over the planet from all walks of life uh, standing up against Israel's genocide in Palestine, standing up against the Zionist movement. However, we also recognize that mobilization without organization and political education is not going to help us meet our objectives. And so our intent with this webinar series was to heighten the level of political consciousness in this movement at this time, to help people understand exactly what Zionism is, exactly what Israel is, and why we have a responsibility to oppose it. So things happening in the world right now are making it really, really clear exactly why we need to be in solidarity with Palestine and moving against Zionism. Of course, the International Court of Justice just came down with an interim ruling, didn't quite call for a ceasefire, and they have not yet called what's happening in Gaza a genocide. But what they did do was call for Israel to preserve life and to end its strategies inciting genocide. Now, is Israel going to listen to the ICJ ruling? Most likely not. They've already made it clear that they don't care what the UN says. They don't care what millions of people in the streets say. They don't care what the STJ says. They are committed to the strategy of genocide in Gaza. However, it is really important for us to recognize the victory of this ICJ ruling. It is more evidence that what's happening on the ground is clear to more and more and more people. It is a win for that movement. It is a win for the struggle against imperialism. So we want to uplift that ruling. We also want to uplift the fact that the axis of resistance, militant forces on the ground in Palestine, forces in Iran, forces in Lebanon are in fact, and in also in Yemen, are in fact making substantial military victories against Israeli imperialism backed by US imperialism. Israel is being defeated militarily and that is why they are targeting so many civilians, why they are engaging in such wanton destruction, uh, targeting innocent people because they cannot win militarily. So we want to shout out the axis of resistance. And overall, we are seeing that Israel is losing control of the narrative. More and more and more people are realizing that this is an entity that has no right to exist, that Zionism is a white supremacist and imperialist movement that has no right to exist, that Palestinians have a just struggle for liberation, and they have every right to fight back in any way they can. Millions of people around the world are waking up to this, and so Israel will never again be able to get away with its crimes. And we also want to, of course, shout out the global anti-Zionist movement, the thousands, millions of people who have been in the street in Ghana, in Azania, in Berlin, in Tampa, Orlando, Boston, New York, Havana, Cuba, all over the world, more and more and more people every single day are waking up to what's happening, are taking action against it. And all of us united together are going to end Israel's occupation of Palestine, are going to end the Zionist movement on Palestinian leadership. So like I mentioned in the beginning, the subject of this webinar is the essential differences between the religion of Judaism and the Zionist movement. The religion of Judaism, like Zionists work really, really, really hard to confuse people about what Zionism is and what Judaism is. They work really, really, really hard to conflate the two in order to basically paralyze people's 
solidarity. They are extremely invested in making people confused about what's happening in occupied Palestine. They're extremely invested in making people believe that what's happening to Palestinians is too complicated to understand, that somehow some kind of like ancient religious conflict that no one should take a side in because it's just too complex. That is not the case. What's happening in occupied Palestine is actually extremely simple. As we've been reiterating at each of these webinars, it is a settler colonial imperialist project backed by Western imperialism, led by the United States. It's land theft, it's genocide, it's colonization. It is not complicated. It's actually a very old story in terms of how imperialism functions. But Zionists work very, very hard especially using the capitalist media to make people believe that Zionism is somehow equal to Judaism, that in order to be aligned with Jewish people, you must support Zionism. This is not only untrue, it is an insult to Jewish people and the Jewish faith. So we are clear about the differences. We wanna share that information with you tonight. Another thing that Zionism works really hard to do through the capitalist media, through the Christian Zionists that are in power in the US is to make people believe that Jewish people who align with the Zionist movement represent the only Jewish perspective on Zionism. That, however, is not true. It has never been true. There are many, many, many anti-Zionist Jews. There are many, many, many Jewish people who oppose every single part of what Israel is doing in Palestine. And one of the most um, famous, most well-known Jewish intellectuals who is a staunch anti-Zionist, who is clear on the question of what is happening in Palestine is a man known as Norman Finkelstein. We wanted to have him speak during the webinar tonight, but he is at this point a very busy person because he is on many, many different media platforms sharing the truth about what's happening in Palestine from an anti-Zionist Jewish perspective. But Norman Finkelstein is a professor. He is the author of many, many books, including a very significant book called The Holocaust Industry, in which he basically unpacks the class contradictions within the Jewish diaspora and how ruling class and petty bourgeois Jewish people aligned with the anti or with, aligned with the Zionist movement basically sold out poor and working class and left Jewish people and helped build Israel into what it is today while aligning with US imperialism. So to give you a little bit of perspective directly from Norman Finkelstein himself, I want to play y'all a brief video. It's about 10 minutes long. It's a clip from a teaching that was hosted by the University of Massachusetts Amherst that gives some important historical perspective on October 7th and on the Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation. And the reason why we want to play this video is to, again, remind folks, to let folks know maybe for the first time, that not all Jewish people align with the Zionist movement. Zionist movement and Judaism are not the same. Zionism is an affront to Judaism, and he makes it very, very clear. So I'm going to share my screen and play this video right now. And if anyone has any issues hearing or seeing, tech team, please let me know. Let me give you an analogy, OK? So let's take the case of the Warsaw Ghetto uh, that was created by the Nazis beginning in 1940. So the uh, people were confined in this ghetto, including my mother and father. They were in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it was clear at after a certain point, not initially, but it was clear at a certain point that they were going to die. There was no question about that. There were, at the beginning, there was skepticism about the rumors that Jews were not being deported to another part of Poland, but they were uh, being deported to death camps. There was skepticism about that inside the ghetto. Actually, my mother told me this story. There was one woman in the ghetto who would shout from her window, shout from her window, you're going to die, you're going to die. And people called her Cassandra from the Greek mythology, the bearer of bad news. And my mother in retrospect said she realized that woman apparently knew something 
that we didn't know. Okay. Come April 1943, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, a handful, a small number, formed what was called the Jewish Fighting Organization. And then they engaged in a quote-unquote uprising. Now the uprising has been vastly exaggerated in Jewish history. It was by any reckoning a very modest affair because they had no weapons. This was the Warsaw Ghetto. They had no real weapons. They had a few weapons. Now, was there, were they going to defeat the Nazis? Was that a realistic prospect when the Russian Red Army couldn't defeat the Nazis? Was it a realistic prospect that the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were going to defeat them? In fact, you can make the argument I'm not making it, but I'm just saying the argument could be made. You can make the argument that the only result of that uprising, the only result was it catalyzed, sped up, accelerated the destruction of the ghetto. Because right after the uprising, the Nazis flattened the ghetto. So. Having said that, I return the question to you. Are we then supposed to conclude that Jews should condemn the Warsaw Ghetto uprising because its only result was as a material fact? Its only result was the acceleration in the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. So far as I know, no Jewish historian and no Jewish individual reckons the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in those terms. In the same way, I don't know of any African American who reckons the Nat Turner Rebellion as a disaster. Now, bear in mind, after the Nat Turner Rebellion, the whites, remember it was the largest slave revolt in American history, the white population went mad, completely berserk, and they would seize hold of any black person in their path and kill them, and kill them and torture them in the most brutal of ways. So, are we supposed to conclude that blacks should condemn the Nat Turner Rebellion, because the only concrete result was it unleashed the frenzied rage of the white population. I don't know of any black person knowledgeable about the revolt who reaches that conclusion. Quite the contrary, as I said, uh, it's an occupies an honored place in American history. So I suspect, I'm not going, I'm not out to sort of cut you down. I suspect there are many Palestinians now who regret what happened on October 7th. I, I, that's perfectly, you know, plausible, perfectly believable. But I would say the historical judgments are complicated. And um, I don't want either to speak for Palestinians or to pretend that I know what history's judgment is going to be. The only point I made in my remarks is I can understand what happened. I once asked my late mother I said to her, well, you know, the Allies, the Western powers, uh, they engaged in what was called the terror bombing of Germany during World War II. They were targeting civilian sites, uh, hoping to break the will of, of the 
German population and eventually force, uh, compel the German population to rid themselves of the Nazis. And I asked um, my mother, well, what do you think about that? My mother was a very humane, very decent person, for sure. No question in my mind. She didn't always act on her words, but her words were good. For that, I can say for certain. Her actions, not perfect, very imperfect. But she, her words were good. Uh, and she said to me, uh, she just turned to me and said, and I remember it verbatim, she said, our view was, if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. She just said it very flatly. If we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. My guess is, I can't prove it. I don't have the evidence. And when I'm speculating, I have a, more, I have a professional and a moral obligation to acknowledge its speculation. My guess is, on October 6th, at night, those folks, those young men who breached the gates of Gaza concentration camp, each of them went to his mother, kissed his mother goodbye, kissed his father goodbye, because they knew they would never be returning. This was their last day. And then inside of them, they thought, now, tomorrow, I'm going to avenge those 20 years of torment in that concentration camp. And I'm going to avenge my sister who was killed my brother who was killed, my nephew who was killed during those murderous operations, as Israel likes to call them. They're mowing the lawn operations. Do you realize what an utterly pathological society it must be to describe massacres inflicted on a concentration camp population as mowing the lawn? Can you even register that in your mind? And they then proceeded on October 7th to carry out a brutally vengeful act for sure, just as my mother said, if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. That's how I read the situation. So once again, that was Norman Finkelstein speaking during a teach-in that was given on October 23rd of last fall at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And in that 10-minute video, he makes a clear connection between the resistance of working-class Jewish people in the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust, between the resistance of enslaved African people during Nat Turner's rebellion, and the organized resistance of Palestinian people during the Al Aqsa flood on October 7th. He makes a moral equivalence and he says very clearly that it was justified. So, again, just want to reiterate that in capitalist media, the ruling class and the Zionists that are aligned with them work really hard to make us believe that all Jewish people are aligned with the Israeli state and what Israel's doing. But people like Norman Finkelstein, people like my comrade Benet Blend, a writer for the, the Palestine Chronicle, people like Professor Ronit Lenton, are all examples of Jewish people who are clear on what Israel is doing in Palestine. And so we have to be clear about the very clear differences between Zionism and the Jewish religion. And we have to refuse to accept any kind of conflation. 
And so now I want to introduce our main presenter for our webinar this evening. So Ajamo Umi is an organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party since 1984. He has organized for the party in several countries on three continents and the Caribbean. He is a senior labor organizer for one of the largest labor unions within the US. He holds a master's degree in economics and political science and is the author of three full length literary fiction novels, as well as a published study on mass incarceration. He has led and done bodyguard work to protect activists against white supremacist groups, as well as led dangerous efforts to liberate foreclosed properties for evicted and houseless people. He is also the person that recruited me into the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And so to educate us on the clear differences between Zionism and anti-Semitism, I'm gonna pass it over to Ajamu. Thank you very much, Comrade Onyesamu. Thank you very much to all of you who are here. Uh, very glad to be able to share with you on this critical question. And I just wanna start by just really giving love, honor, and respect to the uh, organizations who have sponsored this webinar series and to all organizations and folks who are doing anti-Zionist work out here. Um, I, I came into this when I joined the APRP in 1984. And I was, uh, I had just, we had just, we have a work study process where we have to study. You gotta study to belong to our party. And so we had just read this article talking about how the Zionists, Zionist Israel had killed approximately 800 people in the Shabra and Shatila uh, refugee camps in Lebanon um, in 1982. And I was fired up from reading that article. And so a couple of days after I read that article, you know, I was about 21 years old. I went to uh, the university. They had this woman, Geraldine Ferraro, who was running for the uh, vice presidential position on the Democratic Party ticket here in capitalist political elections. And uh, I'm out there, she's talking, and she said, she made a statement. She said that uh, we have to stop these terrorist organizations like the Palestine Liberation Organization, which at that time was the primary organization fighting for Palestinian self-determination. And then she said, and the African National Congress, which you know, if you don't know, was at that time the liberation movement in Azania, what, what we call Azania, what the people there call Azania, what you probably call by the colonial name South Africa. And today, of course, the African National Congress is um, the governing party in Azania um, at, the, at this time. But she made that statement, we have to stop these terrorist organizations, the PLO and the ANC. And I heckled her, I yelled out in the Secret Service, removed me um, from that, uh, whatever it was, uh, capitalist rally. But my point is that, you know, from that point, uh, 40 years ago to today, I've been able to see the progress we've made, um, the level of anti-Zionist consciousness that has developed all across the world. And for someone like myself, it's truly humbling and it's inspiring that people have come to clearly recognize the right side of history, right? And so that's what we're here to talk about when we talk about Judaism and anti-Semitism and Zionism. So that's what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes, especially you all, because here today with, it, with capitalist media in general and Zionist uh, perspectives in particular, you know, with social media, with TikTok, with all of these other uh, platforms, you know, there's every piece of scum on earth who has an opinion about Zionism. And a lot of these people expressing these opinions today are low life Negro scum too. So that's why we as African people, we have to speak to that. Because I'm, I'm watching these people on these video reels and they'll take one element of something and they'll stretch it into something else. And that's why there's so much confusion around this issue. And so I'm hopeful that in the three previous sessions and tonight that we can do work to help clear up that confusion. And also that all of the other great anti-Zionist work is doing a lot to facilitate uh, clearing up that confusion as well, all right? So we'll just start by talking about 
Judaism, which is without question a storied and respected faith and worship. No question about that. And as African people, we have to understand that because Judaism in large part has much of its origins in Africa. And if you want to understand what's meant by that, all you have to do is pick up the Bible, which is one of the books, or the Torah, which is the book of Judaism, and look in the beginning. But if it, particularly since most people, especially in this backward cesspool country, the United Snakes of America, most people here are familiar with the Bible. So let's just work with that. And if you look at a Bible, if you look at the first book in the Bible, which is the book of Genesis, right? And if you look at the Old Testament, it's chapter two, verse 13. Of course, the first country, first place mentioned in the Bible is Ethiopia. Um, if you know the history of the Horn of Africa, the original name, if you have some of the older Bible publications, it's not called Ethiopia, it's called Cush with a C or K. But either way, they're talking about Ethiopia in the Bible. And so this is critical because what the point that's being made is that this is one of the origins of Judaism is in this region of the world. And as far as we know today, the first known Jewish people were the Falasha. And there in the picture on the screen, you see a picture of them worshiping in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This is obviously a recent picture, but these folks practicing Judaism have been around for thousands of years. Now, this is not to confuse a lot of Africans who say, well, we're, we're Jews, so we should, we should be the Zionists. We should control the Zionist state of Israel. We're not, we're not getting involved in that confusion, but we're just making the point to start off that since Judaism has much of its origins as an honored faith and religion in Africa, as conscious African people, we have to be pro-Judaic. And then on this question of Semitism, now all you all have to do, we know there's a lot of confusion, but the reason why the confusion flows as easily as it does, you all, is because we don't read. And I know people, I say that all the time, people get mad, well, I do read, but come on now, y'all know we don't. Like if you go, if you get on public transportation, you go to a restaurant, a coffee shop, you go anywhere you can think of, you do not see in large part people studying volume books and material. That's just not the culture that exists, especially in this backward society. You do see everybody on their phone looking at social media. So if I were to say people don't look at social media, then I could see people you know, getting up in arms about that. But there really is no defense in saying that we don't really study history in these backward societies, these backward capitalist societies that we live in. So since this is the reality, it makes it so much so so much easier for the enemies of humanity to spread misinformation. But even if you pick up their capitalist sources, like Webster's Dictionary, and I'm not, please don't be confused, I'm not endorsing Webster's Dictionary, but I'm saying even if you use their backward sources, right, like a Webster's Dictionary, and look up the word Semite, it's going to tell you that a Semite is a person who has Asian, Arab, African origins. So if you're looking at it from that standpoint to say that people who are anti-Zionists are anti-Semitic, it really doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so we know since we start with the Falasha and then we talk about Judaism, like Christianity, like Islam, like Santeria, like Ife, like Buddhism, like all forms of cultural faiths, or all forms of faiths, rather, are a part of everybody's culture. And so these faiths are that. They're faiths. They're not nationalities. And that's the second point we want to make, because we think that the Zionist movement's efforts to blur the question of faith with nationality is a lot of the reason why there's so much confusion around this question. Now, no, there's no doubt that people will go and people will evolve as human beings and they will engage in practices and, and customs will develop as a part of their evolution as segments of society. No question about that. But what we're 
thing is that Judaism as a favorite form of faith and worship could never be a nationality. Jews come from all nationalities, just like Christians come from all nationalities, just like Muslims come from all nationalities. There's no specific nationality that has, okay, well, we're actually the real Jews or we're the real Muslims or we're the real Christians. So this is something that has to be stated. And it's very uncomfortable for people to state it because of the success of the Zionist movement in convincing us that if we question anything about what the state of Israel is doing, that we're being anti-human or what they call anti-Semitic. So what we want to do is try to give as much clarity to that because truth is objective, you all. It's objective. It's not based upon what we feel or what we think or what we want the world to be. It's based on what it is. So we know that certain nationalities can come to identify with certain faiths and they can carry that faith, right? They can be the primary people who practice that faith, but that does not make the faith their specific nationality because faith and nationality are two completely separate things. So we have to be clear on that, right? Because if we're not clear, then we fall into the trap that the enemies of humanity want us to fall in. For example, a lot of these bottom shoe scum people on social media now, they're making arguments like, well, if you look at Israel today, I saw one the other day when this despicable human being was on there and they're making this argument. If you look at Israel today, uh, uh, about two thirds of the people there are people of Semitic, even if you say Semites, Arabs and Asians, Two thirds of the people in Israel are se Semitic descent. So what are you talking about when you say that uh, these people were not there thousands of years ago? They most certainly were. Okay, so again, if you're confused around this question of nationality, then you'll fall for those kind of horseshoe arguments, right? But the point that you have to remember is that the Zionist state of Israel is about power in the capitalist world, in the imperialist world. That's why the state of Israel was created in the first place. So if I was face to face with that backward human being, what I would tell them is that, so show me which one of these people who you're describing are in a position or any of these falashas who are in the state of Israel, because there are a lot of them there. Show me which one of these people are dictating policy in the state of Israel. All the people dictating policy in the state of Israel are European people, white people, right? If you don't know what I mean when I say European, the people that descend from Europe, all right? Those are the people who make the decisions about policy in the state of Israel. Those are the people who make decisions about policy in the entire capitalist world. That's not, you, you can get mad at me for saying that, but you cannot refute that. That's an irrefutable fact. So this is the point we have to make about this, right? You were not there thousands of years ago. You were not the people that were in Egypt. They love to say that. Well, the Jews were persecuted in Egypt. Well, who was, who was there in Egypt in 1200 BC? Who were the people that were there? That was not Benjamin Netanyahu or anybody that looked like that piece of scum. Those were not the people who were in that region. We are not going to fall for that nonsense. But if you think that, you know, Judaism is a nationality, it's easy for you to fall for that. So that's the first point that we have to make. Again, Judaism is a storied and respected, honored faith. No question about that. With origins largely in East Africa. The Falasha are clear proof of that. And Judaism, like Christianity, Islam, etc., is a faith. It's not a nationality. The next point that we want to talk about is the Zionist system. And as, as I'm sure has been talked about, and I'll just reiterate it because I don't think we can ever say it enough, is that Zionism, unlike Judaism, is not a faith. It's a political movement that was formed in 1897 at a conference in Bau, Switzerland, that was led by a man named Theodore Herzl. And if you read Herzl's memoirs, which is basically his autobiography, he was an affirmed atheist. He didn't even believe in God. And I'm sure most of you know the history 
of the initial history of this movement. And for those that don't, we'll just, again, we can never say this enough, so we'll continue to repeat it, is that these people, their objective was to build a political movement that would create a state that would serve the interests of international capitalism and imperialism. That would be another ally state to this movement of anti-humanism, capitalism, and imperialism. That was their objective. That was their stated objective. That's not my opinion. That was what these people sought to bring into existence when they started the Zionist movement in 1897. And the proof of that is that if you study what happened at that Zionist conference, that founding Zionist conference, they did not even choose Palestine as their original place that they wanted to start. They, they chose a number of other countries, Venezuela, Uganda. They had various reasons as they debated it out why those places would not work for them. Like in the case of Uganda, that's a landlocked country in Central Africa. So they wanted to be able, uh, you know, if you're gonna have a powerful country, it's a good idea to place that country where you can have control of the main shipping routes. So, you know, my point is that it's not an accident that the Zionist state of Israel sits where it sits, where it controls, it has access to control shipping routes in the Mediterranean, right? And that the, the uh, apartheid state of South Africa, as it was known up until 1994, controlled the Cape area of Africa, which is the other main shipping route for products moving from east to west and west to east. Um, in the world. That's not an accident that that happened. That was a part of what these people wanted to do so that they could control, have this political and economic control. So Herzl started this movement and this movement had the objective of creating this nation state, as I mentioned, to serve the interests of international imperialism. And Zionism, because of this, you know, has nothing to do with Judaism. And this book that's on the screen, it's a very difficult book to get. And in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, it used to be on our book list. But the reason why it's no longer there is because of the difficulty in getting it. But if you could ever get your hands on a copy, you should get, get a copy. It's called Moses and Monotheism by Sigmund Freud. And what this book does, for those of you that have been fortunate enough to read it, is Freud makes a very logical argument based on historical and anthropological evidence that Moses and Moses's mother were not, it, 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 it's not clearly, we don't have enough evidence to say what they were. He argues that they probably were African people. We're not necessarily making that argument, but he certainly makes the point clear in the book with the evidence that he presents that Moses and his family were never, they never spoke Hebrew. They never spoke Hebrew as a language. Um, if anything, they spoke Amoritic, which is spoken largely by people in that region of the world in Africa. And he makes those arguments to make the point that the people who were in that region of the world were people of color and were not these European Zionists, these Ashkenazi uh, European people who call themselves Jews. You know, I, I make the argument that if you stand with the state of Israel, you're, you're not a Jew. You're a Zionist, plain and simple. So let's talk about this question of the tricks that Zionism uses to further co concretize its dominance um, in its position in the Middle East. Because once the Zionist movement was established, and once the Zionist state of Israel, or formerly Palestine, was chosen, these people knew they had to have a clear strategy to ensure that their movement would be protected. And so they began to do work, and they created an organization called the World Zionist Congress, or the WZC, the World Zionist Congress. And after the death of Theodore Herzl, other people took over the Zionist movement. And one of those people, his name was Shame Wiseman. And this filthy Zionist, he took, he did a lot of the work. A lot of people know, they've heard Theodore Herzl, but they, a lot of people, most people haven't heard of Shame Wiseman. But I would argue he did more work to advance the Zionist movement um, from his time 
around the turn of the 20th century up through the 1920s to solidify uh, the foundation of the movement to create the state of Israel. That's where Wiseman, I believe, made his strongest contribution to Zionism. And how he did that was primarily working first to create support for the Balfour Declaration. And what the Balfour Declaration was, was in 1917, there was an evil access uh, of power that existed between the World Zionist Congress, between the apartheid state of South Africa, who had a prime minister at that time named Jan Smuts, right? And so, and then you had, of course, you already know the United Snakes of America, Woodrow Wilson was president then. These three cracker countries, controlled countries, uh, aligned themselves together and created this Balfour Declaration where Lord Balfour in Britain uh, was the person who declared that Palestine at that time belonged to Britain and that Britain was in the position to make decisions about what would happen in Palestine. That's like somebody coming in your house right now and saying, okay, hey, how you doing? Good. Okay, I'm taking over your house. I'm making all the decisions about what happens in your house. So when we say that, that the Zionist state of Israel is a settler colony, that's why we say to people, why are you calling it a settler colony? That's because that's exactly what they did. They came into Palestine and took it over. This Balfour Declaration was designed to say this is actually the state of Israel, Palestine. And so this is important, you all, because this is where the settlements started happening, where all these Ashkenazi European so-called Jews began to say, okay, now we're going to go to Palestine and we're going to settle there. There was already some of that happening, but the Balfour Declaration proliferated that action. And even today, if you go to most of these Zionist synagogues in this country and around the world, you will find that they have these always, they're always raising money for these teenagers, 17, 18 years old, to do these kibbutzes, as they call them, where they go to Zionist Israel and they stay there for a year, two years, and hopefully they decide to stay there permanently. This is how they've been able to get the population there to take over the country. And the Balfour Declaration was the initial salvo to ensure that that process was firmly put in place, right? And also, and this is another reason why any conscious African has to be anti-Zionist, is that the picture on your screen is of the Venetia diamond mine in Azania. And I already told you Azania is a Zulu word. That's what our people call that region that the colonist name is South Africa. Our people in that region, the Zulu folks, the Otha folks, folks who are there uh, call it Azania, which means land of the black faces or burnt faces in Zulu. That's what, it, that's what the name of the country is. So that's what we call it. But so... This mine is there. It's called the Venetia Mine. It's the largest diamond mine in the world, you all. The largest diamond producing mine on the planet Earth. And what these evil access people did is they established a mechanism. Because one of the things that they were debating was, so how, do we, how are we going to finance the development of the state of Israel and how are we going to have a strong economy once we establish the state of Israel? And they came up with one of the major ideas they had was that, well, we will make the state of Israel the primary diamond polishing destination on the planet Earth. And so from 1917 on, they established this relationship with De Beers Diamonds, which even to this day is the largest diamond producing company on the entire planet. And it started in Azania around this time, 1917, uh, uh, years before, a few years before that. It was founded by this uh, crooked cracker, Cecil Rhodes, and the Oppenheimer family bought it and they still own it today. In fact, Nikki Cracker Oppenheimer today is one of the richest people in all of Africa because of their theft of the diamonds. And just a side note real quick, Okay, because some of us are, you know, we're so wrapped up in this liberal nonsense. And someone asked me the other day, well, what about 
all of those black youth that are breaking in the diamond stores and stealing the diamonds, you know, because they show these pictures a lot, these videos. And I said, I don't give a damn. I mean, those are our diamonds in the first place. They, they should go in there and take every goddamn diamond. They're ours. We, we should get them back. The only problem I have with the youth is that they should, the money should go from those diamonds to the struggle for liberation and organization among our people. It shouldn't just go for you to create more individual bling for yourself. But aside from that, I don't have any slightest problem. If people take back, if they have reparations from the thieves who stole the diamonds, those aren't your damn, now you stole those diamonds. You continue to steal them. This has been going on forever. And in fact, today, 40% of the polished diamonds on the planet Earth are polished in the Zionist state of Israel, and there is not a single diamond mine in all of the state of Israel or occupied Palestine. Those diamonds come from places like this Venetia diamond mine in Azania or the Congo or one of these, or Sierra Leone or one of these places. So for a hundred years, Africa has been exploited to uphold the Zionist movement in the state of Israel. That's again, why any conscious African has to be anti-Zionist. And then another thing about this World Zionist Congress, right? Because they organize intensely in Europe to raise support for the Zionist state. And I recommend a book that everybody should read. You. It's called the it's called Zionism in the State of Dictators. Zionism in the State of Dictators by Lenny Brenner. He's a professor um, and he's an anti, he was an anti-Zionist Jew. But this book is outstanding in terms of clearly illustrating the work of the World Zionist Congress a hundred years ago and what they did because they were able to, to do extensive work in all of Europe. Now, there's absolutely no question that Jewish European Jews were oppressed in Europe. If you know anything about European history, Europe has a history of religious intolerance. That's why this backward cesspool colony was created in this country in the first place, right? That's what they told you in school. The pilgrims and the Puritans and all those scum came here escaping religious persecution. So there's no question about that. So what this did is it created conditions where these World Zionist Congress organizers were able to go into Poland. They were able to go into uh, Austria, into Romania, into Russia, um, into all of these uh, states where large numbers of European Jews live. And they worked with the governments in those countries to tell them, like, you don't want these Jews here. No, we don't want them here. Well, we're trying to create a state for Jews. So why don't the, go ahead and oppress the hell out of these people? And that will further convince them that the best possible solution for them is the state that we're trying to establish in what was at that time occupied Palestine. And the kicker in this is that one of the places that was a part of these negotiations with, with the World Zionist Congress was the Nazi Third Reich. In other words, yes, what I'm saying is the World Zionist Congress negotiated with the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, to push these Ashkenazi Jews to support the Zionist state of Israel. No question. Similar to what uh, Mr. Finkelstein was talking about in the video, you know, there's, there's all these strange and ironic similarities, right? Like where you are uh, now today engaged in the same type of terrorism against the Palestinian people that was once perpetuated against you. And that's just, you know, one of the real shames of this, along with going back a hundred years ago, the world Zionist movement, they were very cunning, you all. So they came to this country and they knew that they could manipulate the African population here. Why? Because who else in America would be more sensitive to a movement designed to get you home than the African masses in the US who were forced to come to this backward empire 
by the transatlantic slave trade and have been treated miserably as long as we've been here. And so the Zionist movement saw this. And so they actually manipulated the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in the 1920s to sponsor a fundraising tour for the World Zionist Congress. And they went from city to city because remember, the word Zion means to return home. So what these vicious criminals did is they went from city to city and talked to African audiences and said, you all are trying to get home. We're trying to get home. Help us get home and we'll help you get home. And these Africans gave whatever money they could to the Zionist movement because we were emotionally pulled in to think that that was a national liberation movement. Like our movement is a national liberation movement. But of course, then a lot more of us, we had the work of the Garvey movement, right? The Universal Negro Improvement Association they had millions of members. So we weren't as confused as we are today. Like we knew we were trying to get home to Africa. Now today, you know, you ask African, the capitalism been working on us for a hundred years. Well, I'm not even African. I'm I'm American. I'm Native American. I'm all this. I talked to someone the other day and they were, I'm, I'm Native American. I said, didn't you tell me you got a DNA test? What does it say? Crickets. I'm like, yeah, you don't want to show me that because you know damn well you ain't no Native American. That's our work. Y'all, if you ain't African, don't worry about that. We're doing our work with our people. We, we've spent 500 years having Africa disparaged, disrespected, and all of that because the people who control all of Africa's resources today are the same people who control Zionist Israel, the same types of people anyway. And so they know that in order for their efforts to continue to uh, maintain empire, they have to exploit African resources. The only way they can do that is to convince the African masses that we don't have anything to do with Africa. That has nothing to do with us. But we'll, we'll correct that. We're in the process of doing that. But we're just making the point that these folks organized on a worldwide level to raise support for their movement and they exploited our people in order to gain resources to do that. Another reason why any conscious African has to be anti-Zionist. So the takeaways that we wanna share with you is again, as we mentioned, we can't say it enough, Judaism is a time honored and respected faith with origins in Africa, right? Zionism is an imperialist aligned political movement. Judaism and Zionism have absolutely nothing to do with one another. Judaism is not a nationality. Judaism, say that again, is not a nationality. It is a faith. Anybody can be a Jew, no matter what nationality you are. So if that's the case, how can it be a nationality? That wouldn't even make sense. How could Christianity be a nationality? But because of, you know, the, the history of the world, the last several hundred years, this these questions have become totally confused. And, and now it's like, you you know, the, the Zionist system, they've done a wonderful job of making it so that even to bring up these questions um, is to to make a anti-Semitic claim, quote unquote. So we don't want to fall into that trap. We want to call it. And another thing we want to do is make sure that we are clear, like criticizing the state of Israel does not make you anti-Judaic. The state of Israel has nothing to do with Judaism. We got to keep making that point. I remember years ago, there's an African here in California where I am who is an artist. And this African, it was the time that I got to bodyguard for Dr. Betty Shabazz the widow of El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, 1996. And at the San Francisco State University uh, campus, there was a mural that this African artist painted. And in the mural, this African painted a picture of the Israeli flag crossed out. And so these Zionists, they vandalized the mural. And then the mural was recommissioned. And that's why we had a big event to reintroduce the mural. And that's why Dr. Shabazz was there. But my point is that this is uh, the, the arguments, there were arguments happening at that time. And a lot of people were saying, well, the reason why they vandalized it, they had a right to vandalize it because he was disrespecting Judaism. 
And we were like, no, we're not disrespecting Judaism. We're disrespecting Zionism because Zionism disrespects us. And I, you know, I had a chance to speak at that rally. And I told him, my mama taught me, you respect people that respect you. We don't respect nobody that doesn't respect you. So we don't, we, we're not disrespecting Judaism, we're disrespecting Zionism. And we understood that they're two completely different things. So conscious African and other revolutionaries, of course, have a moral and historical obligation to be anti-Zionist. Y'all, y'all, you can't be mealy-mouthed and scared. You know, if you don't fully understand the issue, that's why we're always saying you got to have an organized study process because we have that in the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And so this is the reason why the Anti-Defamation League said we were the most anti-Zionist force in the U.S. And we that's a compliment to us. We, oh, we don't want to be... We don't want to be, hell yeah, we want to be called that. Because that's what every conscious human being should be, is anti-Zionist without question. But you can't be, they have so much propaganda, you can't be uh, solidly anti-Zionist if you don't have a clear understanding of this history. And the only way you get that is through studying this history. And so the last point I make is even within our movements, and the reason why we have been able to benefit as much as we have, you know, we the, the statement that, you know, we stand on the back of those backs of those who came before us is without question true. It's objectively true. And we know this because we know that we talked about the World Zionist Congress exploiting the African masses in this country to support the Zionist movement. And it didn't just stop with Shane Wiseman and the World Zionist Congress going into the 1950s and the early 60s, an organization was founded called BASIC, Black Americans in Support of Israel Committee. And if you think of any major establishment African leader, from Al Sharpton to Jesse Jackson, to Uncle Kuhn, to even the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., quite honestly, all of them have been members of BASIC. And this is the direct result of what we've talked about here, the confusion around this question. And even a lot of these uh, bottom shoe scum, and they, there was even one coon that was on, uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm calling him a coon, that's what he is, um, that was on uh, TikTok with a video, with a speech snippet from Dr. King talking about Israel. Okay, you know, we know that Dr. King did not live long enough to work through his position on Zionism. That's all, that's all that was. But these people are exploiting the fact that we don't study the history of our own movement, the history of Dr. King. So a lot of us, they'll show you, you got, if it's not some of you, it's some of your family and friends, they saw that snippet and they'll tell you, well, Dr. King was, he supported Israel. So I, I support Israel because Dr. King. So that's how easy they get us because we don't, study anything right so that's why they do that kind of stuff because they know we're not going to check it out so we have to check it out we have to be better you all we got to be a lot better because dr king was a principal human being that's my point he was a principled man and the reason why we know that is if we study his work it's clear he was a principled man from the very beginning when he got involved in the Montgomery Boycott Association in 1955, he didn't even go to that meeting to be the president of that association. He was nominated and he saw the necessity to rise to responsibility, so he accepted it. And getting into the 60s, it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that pushed Dr. King to come out against the Vietnam War. He refused to do it at first. That's objective, that's history. And they pushed him to do that. And he was a principal man. And you all know if you're principal people, because some people, you know, there's all kinds of people that listen to these programs. There's people who are principal folks who want to do what's right. Some of y'all are police. So we know there's all kinds of people here. You know, so I'm talking to the y'all police. You can take a break and get your coffee or whatever. But the principal people that are on here, you know that when something happens in your life and you don't feel like you made the right decision or you question whether you made the right decision, you know it bothers the hell out of you, doesn't it? 
that's because you're a principal human being. And the point I'm making is that Dr. King was that way. He was a principal human being. So that doesn't mean, I'm not saying he, nobody's right about anything, but I'm saying he moved to understand that he needed to take a position against the Vietnam War. He moved to understand that he was not going to be used to criticize the Black Power Movement. You can't find any any speech by Dr. King where he's saying, well, you know, African people shouldn't be rising up against America. He made his position clear. He said that uh, as long as this system treats African people the way it does, then these are the results that you're going to get from that. So this was a principled man. So my point is that had he lived long enough, I have no question that he would have come to the point where he understood the contradictions of Zionism. Now, those other people I named, you know, they're in the back pocket of capitalism. You know, so they they're, you know, they're they're taking the positions they take because it puts money in their pocket, it keeps them in a prestigious position, and they can pose as leaders of the African people when nobody that I know anointed them to do anything for African people. So this is the difference. So we have to understand that because another contribution that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee made for us is Ethel Minor, and I have to say this to close because you know the African women and the marginalized people are always written out of history, but Ethel Minor was an African woman who was in the Nation of Islam. And the Nation of Islam had really the first anti-Zionist position in this country, quiet as that's kept. You know, they had that position in the 1940s. You know, they, they had nuanced reasons for having it, you know, part of that is that their their position is that well, no, we're the chosen people, you know, but but they still had it, right? So she was in the Nation of Islam in the early 60s. And when Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam in 1964, she was influenced by his anti-Zionist uh speeches that he had done in the nation. And she left the nation with him. She joined the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which was the organization Malcolm founded when he left the Nation of Islam. And when Malcolm was assassinated, Ethel Minor joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. And in SNCC, she drafted a position paper on the question of Zionism. And SNCC studied this paper, debated this paper, and this was the reason that the anti-Zionist position won out in SNCC. And in 1967, during the Arab-Israeli War, SNCC was the first organization in this country, African organization, to come out with an anti-Zionist position. They did that. And of course, if you know the history, the Zionist movement came at SNCC with a vengeance. A lot of the funding that SNCC had to do their civil rights work came from the Zionist community and those funds dried up literally overnight, literally overnight. But the activists within SNCC, a lot of them came into the All African People's Revolutionary Party, right? People like Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael, even Ethel Minor for a while was in the All African People's Revolutionary Party. So this is why from the very beginning, like Comrade Onyesamu said, the AAPRP has always had, since 1968, an anti-Zionist position. When you come into this organization, it's not debatable. It's a principle. If you don't want to, well, I don't, I don't want to be in support of Israel, then you're in the wrong place. You need to go join some other organization because we are not going to compromise on this question for any number of reasons that we've stated. So just understand that it's our responsibility to criticize the state of Israel. Don't fall into that trap. Well, I can't say anything against Israel because Jews live, no. Criticize the hell out of Israel, please. Every chance you get. And not only that, it's not enough for us just to be talking, right? All of you, I know all these people on here, it's a lot of people on here, I don't even know you, but I know this, I would say, the majority, at least 51%, if not more, of the people on here are not in any organization fighting on a consistent basis. I don't even know you, and I know that's true. How do I know this? Because if you were in an organization, if all of us were in an organization, we would not We would be farther along than we are. Think about it for a second. I know some of you are mad because you don't want anybody to call you out, but 
we we're we're revolutionaries so we got to be honest we can't be you know we're not gonna appeal to your ego i don't need you to appeal to mine we're trying to get free you all and the only way we're gonna do that is we gotta create an environment where all this nonsense is no longer it's not you know acceptable so we're just saying you can't refute it if 20 percent of the people in any given society we're in organizations fighting for justice on a consistent basis. We would be so much farther ahead. If 20% were engaged in political education study and ongoing work, we would be farther ahead. Nobody can refute that. So you've got to be in an organization and your organization has to have a political education program. And that program has to be anti-Zionist. It also should be anti-capitalist. It should be anti-patriarchy. And of course, anti-white supremacy, right? It has to be all of that. Anti-homophobia, it has to be all of those things. But it starts with the political education program because you're an organization, you don't have consistent political education. There's no way with this relentless propaganda that these Zionists and this capitalists put out there that you're not going to be influenced by it on some level. And I'll just give one more example, and then I'll stop. I remember we organized an event in the party some years ago, and it was a women's event. It was during March. It was a women's event. And we had representatives there from our All-African Women's Revolutionary Union. We had representatives from the Irish Republican Socialist Movement. We had representatives from the Palestinian Movement. And we had a, a woman represented from the American Indian Movement. And they were all speaking on the question of women. And I don't remember why or how, but at some point, this question of Zionism, probably because, you know, the Palestinians were speaking about it there, but I don't remember exactly how it happened, but it came up. And somehow what, I, what I'm saying I don't remember is someone in the audience said, raised this question of nationality. And it kind of derailed the whole conversation because people were not comfortable saying, no, there's no nationality, it's a faith. You know, I, somebody said that and people attacked that. You know, and I think someone said, well, I'm Jewish and it's my nationality and, you know, we eat these bagels or whatever the hell they said. And that's the kind of thing that in 2024, we need to prepare ourselves to deal with so that we have a concrete understanding of these issues and we can address them in a strong historical and ideological fashion. And then we can go out and do the work to facilitate that. Because even at the weak state that we are right now, you all, we're winning. That's why you see all these efforts on behalf of Zionism. You saw the Zionist, I can't even remember the, the crooked cracker's name, but some Zion, somebody that was in the former member of the Israeli Knesset, that's their legislature, their imperialist settler colonial legislature in, in uh, the state of Israel, this woman was speaking here and, and she said, well, the black youth are the biggest problem we have because they're, they're just rebellious. And because they're just rebellious, the Palestinian struggle, somebody comes and tells them to adopt that struggle and they do it. No, that's not why we're rebellious. That's your racist interpretation of us. The reason why we're rebellious is because we know, even as unconscious as we are, we talk about, Kwame Trey used to talk about, there's consciousness and there's self-consciousness. Consciousness is when you see somebody in the streets, you see a man beating a woman or a marginalized gender person. You know that's wrong. Everybody sees that, knows that's wrong. You're conscious of that. Self-consciousness is you say, I want to get involved and work to do something about that, to organize communities so that can't happen. That's the difference between consciousness and self-consciousness. The self-conscious person is going to engage in work to address the problem, right? So this is what we're talking about when we say that uh, this question of Zionism and the political education and all these things, this is the work that self-conscious people do in 2024 and beyond. And the more of this work we do, the stronger our movement gets. The stronger our movement gets, the closer to victory we get. The closer to victory we get, the closer, the, the faster we're gonna get to victory, you all. And I promise last thing, to the African people. So 
you know, there's we got a lot of work to do in our communities, but that's okay because if you're not African, you got a whole hell of a lot of work to do in your community too. So that's okay. But one of the things that we have to do in our communities, what we've been, what I've been trying to say here is get our people involved in organization. So one of the talking points that's happening in our community, and a lot of these, you know, shiftless, worthless coons on social media are reiterating this, is the Palestinians, the Arab struggle ain't got nothing to do with us. Why would we talk about that struggle? It has nothing to do with us. Um, we don't need to talk about that. No Arabs ever done anything for us. And, you know, this is about as stupid an argument as you can make. And when you hear, when I see somebody talking like that, I know this person hasn't read a book since high school. They don't know a damn thing. And I know, I know you Africans on here, you know somebody that talks like that. If it's not you, you know somebody else that talks like that. And so here's how we easily explode that argument. Our position, and we are articulated here, the Zionist state of Israel is largely financed based on exploiting our African resources. That's irrefutable. And so if the Palestinians defeat the state of Israel, I don't care if every single Palestinian in the world hated African people, I'm still going to be anti-Zionist. I'm still going to support the Palestinian people because when if they win, that helps our struggle for Pan-Africanism. That's irrefutable. Now, I'm saying that hypothetically. I We do a lot of work and have for years. So unlike the individual uh, Negroes on TikTok, I, we, we do tons of work with Palestinian people. So we know that they support our struggle. We know, I've known that since I was a teenager. But if you're just an individual sitting in a dark hovel, how a, a small, dirty, stinky apartment with a computer barely aware whether your internet service is going to be on long enough for you to type more confusion, it just as an individual with no connection to anybody else other than your cat that's sitting there, even the cat has enough damn sense to be anti-Zionist, then you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about when I say this stuff. But for those of you who are honest people and want to really ensure that you get a knowledge and that you understand how to make your best contribution to the planet Earth, these are the things you have to do. Make sure you're in an organization, make sure that that organization has a strong political education program, and make sure that that political education program is anti-Zionist, anti-capitalist also, anti-patriarchy, anti-homophobia, anti-white supremacy, all of those things. And I'm telling you, if more of us do that, we'll have victory, like Kwame Ture used to say, as the sun follows the moon. And with that, I'll stop and thank you all for paying attention. Thank you so much, Ajamu. Please, like, let's share some love. I see the uh, emojis, like, give the clap emoji, give the heart emoji, share some love for all the knowledge that was just dropped right now. Appreciate you so much, Ajamu. Look at all that. Look at that love. You just educated the people for free, for free, y'all. Uh, so. <laughs> We are going to move into the audience Q&A. There was a lot of knowledge dropped in that presentation. We see your questions coming in. We encourage you to su keep submitting those questions. We have about 30 minutes to talk to Ajamu to get deeper into some of the concepts that he just shared with us about. So um, we've been collecting your questions sent in thus far. So let's get started. First question, and this is actually something that uh, I think is like really, really important. So um, Israel works really, really hard to conflate Zionism and Judaism. They call themselves the Jewish state. They have the Star of David on their flag. They paint the Star of David on the rockets that they use to murder Palestinians. And so they're like, we're the Jews and we're killing you. And the Palestinians are like, the Jews are killing us. And the people in the West are like, wow, that was anti-Semitic. So the question from the audience is, how do we make clear that there is a substantive difference between the anti-Semitism of reactionaries and white supremacists and the frustrations of Palestinians? Sometimes in organizing spaces, we expect a perfect morality on the part of colonized people while they have bombs rain on them. Right. And I think that, again, you know, we have to we got to remember that this society we live in today, you know, of course, truth and justice and objective uh, material reality are separated, right? They should always be the same thing, but they're not. So I think we have to make it our responsibility to establish that foundation of truth. 
you know, I mean, we can't we can't be liberal with it and be like, well, these folks are suffering. So, you know, we can't tell the truth. We always have to tell the truth. And there's ways to do that, that, you know, uphold people. Right. We don't have to do it in a way that tears people down. But I think it's our responsibility to say, you all, I think it's important that we remember the difference between Judaism and Zionism. And that you explain that. And once you do that, in that sort of approach, nobody's going to say, well, how dare you say that? You know, people will get it. You know, people might get wrapped up in the emotional element of it. But I think we have to always stay grounded in truth because that's the strongest weapon we have, right? So, you know, a lot of times I think we get, we're intimidated. We don't want to, you know, we think, oh, this person's African that, so we can't say anything, or this person's Palestinian, we can't say anything. You know, we don't, we shouldn't do these types of identity politics, right? Like, like because somebody's African, we can't criticize them if they say something. No, if they're African, they say something wrong, criticize their backward ideas and anyone else. You know, that's our responsibility to do that. And you just have to learn ways to do it in constructive ways, but that's it. Thanks so much, Ajamu, for that clarity. The next question we have for you is, what do you make of the increasingly growing movement that calls for more liberal forms of Zionism? Like, for example, people will say, like, the Netanyahu government is far right wing, but there are other Israeli governments that might be more progressive that we might, like, Palestinians might be able to work with. So what do you make of those calls to respect, like, the more liberal forms of Zionism? And can such a Zionism exist? Right. So... You know, there's a concept, right? Historical and dialectical materialism. It's the struggle of opposites, right? This is this is the nature of human life. And so it's important to understand those principles because the more resistance that happens against the Zionist state of Israel, the more they're gonna have to compromise, right? That's just what happens. And so as they compromise, they will produce these more liberal forms. You know, they have a labor party in the state of Israel that is supposed to be, they have the Likud and the Labor Party. The Likud is the right wing, that's Netanyahu's, right? And then the Labor Party is supposed to be the Liberal Party. It's like the Democratic and Republican Party. They're both capitalist parties. So I think for, you know, what your politics are, right? Like for us, we're revolutionaries, so we're not for any capitalist political party. So we stand consistent on the question. The land belongs to the Palestinian people. We don't feel, you know, it's their struggle. We don't, but if you ask us, our opinion, we don't feel like they should have to compromise and share the country and create two states. I don't see why they, if somebody breaks in my house, I don't have to, well, here, I'll give you the, the, the family room and the living room and I'll stay in the bed. We don't, I don't, we don't see why they have to do that. Like it's their country. If, if these people, who certainly were oppressed as European Jews have a problem, they should petition Germany and Poland and, and Romania for some land and Russia. That's who they have a grievance against. The Palestinians had absolutely nothing to do with the Holocaust. So I don't see why we have to compromise with this liberalism. It's, it's a tactic designed to get to normalize Zionism and get us to accept it. Absolutely. And that like really builds upon, we had uh, uh, comrade Nick Estes from the Red Nation presenting on the first webinar. Where we talked about settler colonialism and Zionism, and he made the same point that regardless of how it's packaged, regardless of whether they present themselves as right wing or as liberal, we have to refuse to normalize Israel. And he was, he's an indigenous comrade. He said, we have to refuse to normalize the United States. We have to recognize these right. are settler colonies. They are settler right. states. They will always be settler states. The land belongs to the Palestinians, the land belongs to the indigenous nations, and that's it, period, no matter how it's sold to us. So definitely appreciate that clarity. That's it. Can I, just one more thing on that. That is it. That is exactly right. And for those of you that say that you're revolutionaries, because I, you know, I see this a lot, right? People say, well, I'm revolutionary, but all you're talking about is Biden versus Trump. And I'm like, I get it. Like, I, I, you, there's nothing you could tell me. Like, I, I'm fully aware of what's happening with the U.S. electoral politics. But where is your revolutionary program, right? Remember who you, what you say your politics are. Like, you should have some sort of program. Your whole program shouldn't be, well, we can't get Trump elected. Then you're not a revolutionary. You're a liberal. You're a liberal capitalist. That's what you are. And if that's what you are, that's what we're going to call you. Great clarity. Appreciate that.
So next question is, so the U.S. empire is very opportunistic. It's a very fair weather friend. We see all throughout history, them aligning with reactionary governments. And then as soon as it's like not in their best interest, they flip on the government. Like, for example, like Saddam Hussein in Iraq, that's an example. For a long time, the U.S. was like really, really close with Saddam Hussein. And then as soon as they were like tired of him, they were like, let's get him out of here. And they destroyed the country. So it, do you think that there's any chance that U.S. imperialism could stop support for Israel and Zionism? And what do you think would happen to Israel if it did? Well, if if that happened, I don't think that'll ever happen. But if it did happen, Israel would no longer be able to exist because their entire budget is propped up. You know, the US, the largest welfare recipient in the U.S. is not an African woman. I know that's what they want you to think. It's the state of Israel. They get $5 billion of your tax dollars if you're in the U.S. every year. That's, that's what we're pissed about. I don't want to finance no crooked cracker state that's oppressing people. So this is what they do. So they, yeah, I mean, I, there's no way they could exist without that. But to your question, the core of your question is that they, they have to maintain their support for the state of Israel because that's their rock solid ally in that region. I mentioned that they're able to control in large part the shipping routes in the world that come through there because of that. They're able, that's the only uh, state in the Middle East that they trust. Like they don't trust, they don't trust the, the Arab states, even though uh, most of those Arab states like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, their Uncle Tom states, you know, they love whatever the, the white capitalist tells them to do. They bend down and do it. They bow down more to them than they do Allah, but they still don't trust them. So Israel, the state of Israel is the one entity. And that's part, a large part of the reason why they've always supported the establishment of the state of Israel there, that they trust in that region and that they can rely on to carry out the interests of international capitalism and imperialism. So because of that, they'll always have to be ally. And that's why, you know, you know, the, the U.S., they go down with because they, you know, this is a declining capitalist system. They can't afford. They have to go down with it. Any slight slim to none chance they have for victory, they have to take it because that's all they got at this point. So they'll back the most desperate, despot, criminal that they can because that's what they have to do. So I don't think that they will ever stop supporting the Zionist state of Israel. And I don't even think about it like that. I, I, I put my faith in the masses of humanity. I expect the United States to do what it does, be a criminal empire. And what I want us to do is put our energies and efforts towards organizing so that we can walk right over their chest. I don't give a damn what they think they're going to do or what their agenda is. We have to organize so that we gain power for the masses of people on the planet Earth. Thanks so much, Ajamu. And I think that's a really excellent point. Like we have to understand, especially those of us who are organizing in solidarity with Palestine, who are taking the streets to call for a ceasefire, we also have to be very, very clear on why the U.S. supports Israel, on what the geopolitical significance of Israel is for Western imperialism led by the United States. Like I, th I think that unless we have that as the foundation of our analysis, we're just going to be doing like a lot of like treading water like just doing like symbolic actions because we're not understanding the fundamental contradiction. So I think that's a really, really important point to make. Another um, really important connection between the U.S. and Israel is, like I mentioned, they're both settler states. They're both European settler states, and they have very, very similar origin stories. And so can you talk a little bit about the link between Zionism and the oppression of indigenous people in the United States? Right. Well, you know, of course, the capital, the world capitalists, network all of these countries there's a link to that like they they are in control of the world today whether you talk about britain france germany belgium spain um all of these uh countries in europe canada australia the united snakes of america like all of these countries what they have in common right is that all of them have accumulated the wealth and the power they have by exploiting other people, colonizing other people. If they didn't directly colonize them, then they, or enslave them, because that's a part of the, when I say colonization, that's a part of that. If they didn't directly do that, then they benefited from that. So if you look at Australia, that's what they did. You know, they colonized the land from the, the Aboriginal African people who went over there marched over there when they had land to do that 40,000 years ago. They're still African people, 
you know, and if you don't know that, they know that because they participated in every Pan-African Congress that's happened. So they do that there. Canada is no question a settler colonial state. You know, they stole indigenous land and they built their wealth on that. You know, the, the whole uh, Canadian uh, enrichment process a couple hundred years ago was based on moving indigenous people, building their railroads so they could ship products and build their economy and their empire. Um, Y'all know the United Snakes of America, you know, that where it got its wealth from the transatlantic slave trade, just like all of Europe. So, of course, you know, all of these settler colonial regimes, whether you're talking about the uh, uh, Canada or the U.S., uh, the Zionist state of Israel, Australia, or uh, Azania, right, they all have these European populations, and they benefited, they built the wealth from these societies. So they have to maintain these, you know, a settler colony in 2024, what that's telling you is that if they were not there, that wealth could not exist. So the U.S. is not going to give up America. The indigenous people have to fight, as they're doing, to get this land back. And they will win. It's their land. They will win it back. You know, I had a European other day, well, if they win it back, what's going to happen to me? I'm like, you need to kayak your ass back to Europe. I don't know. I don't care. You know, that's not my problem. I, what we're trying to do is help them get their land back. You are not our concern right now. You know, and, and the fact that you're saying that like that validates why you don't need to be our concern. So all of these places have that in common. Like the people are building movements to run these people out because that's the first thing that needs to happen for them to solidify the movements that they're engaged in to win back their self-determination and empower themselves. Thank you. Such clarity. Perfect. Now let's talk about some confusion. Um, so capitalists, ruling class, the Zionist movement oftentimes tries to recruit colonized people, uh, particularly African people, to be its mouthpieces. So during your presentation, you mentioned the organization BASIC. Can you talk a little bit more about what BASIC is and what its purpose was? Yeah, so BASIC's uh, primary objective was to ensure that, and this is what, if you look at their website, because they still exist, um, this is what they state on their website, to ensure that legislation is consistently passed to support the state of Israel. And so all of these, th you don't have a national politician, an African national politician that's not a part of BASIC. Barack Obama was an officer in BASIC. They all have been doing this. And so that's why these people come out. We stand unequivocally with the state of Israel. That's why they did, because they're committed to that. You know, and this is important because a lot of people, you know, a lot of us are confused by mysticism and sentimentality. And so, you know, someone said to me not long ago, well, how do you know, you know, maybe Obama's just confused about that question. And he, if he gets the right books, I'm like, this dude, like, you know, you have to recognize the the capitalist system has cadre, all right? And these people I've named, Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Barack Obama, they're the they're the national bourgeoisie cadre, African cadre for the capitalist system. Their job is to convince our people to go along with the capitalist agenda. And that's what they do. So they're committed to that. They're not confused. They, they didn't miss the right book. They are committed to the agenda that they're carrying out, just like we're committed to the agenda that we're carrying out. So they have to, uh, there isn't a, a policy in support of the state of Israel that these basic people haven't been active in terms of struggling with these legislators to make sure that it passes. And that's important because you need to know what these people are doing. All of those people in the Congressional Black Caucus in the legislature, I think might maybe one or two of them, but the overwhelming majority of them are a part of BASIC and pro-Zionists. Exactly the kind of clarity we need. We oftentimes will call um, U.S. elected officials progressive, but when you look at the question of Palestine, when you look at the question of imperialism in general, it's revealed what their actual positions are. And I really like the framing of the ca uh, cadres for capitalism, because again, it gives us the clarity to understand like what side these people are actually on. They're not misguided. They're not confused. They're very clearly ideologically committed and aligned. I feel like Biden is another example of that. Right. Like when people are calling him the lesser evil, I was like, do you do you know who that is? <laughs> Colonizer for his whole life. Um, right. 
He's he's got a proven resume. Exactly. Right? You got to know who these people are. You know, we don't know. We get caught up in, oh, well, Barack, he sings Al Green. So, you know, he plays basketball. He must be cool. Like, we don't we don't even, we're, we're so, the bar is so low. Well, let's talk about the resistance. Um, what critical goals must be reached in order to preserve as many Palestinian lives as possible and as much land as possible? And how does the All African People's Revolutionary Party fit into these goals? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the Palestinian people know exactly what they're doing, right? They they have generations of this trauma, right? So, you know, people talk about Hamas. Hamas emerged out of the Intifada, right? The Intifada was in 1987. These youth in Palestine started throwing rocks and bottles at the Israeli Defense Forces. So, you know, they they know what to do. And they have there are a number of forces over there. And I'm sure they're doing whatever work they need to do that have coalesced to, and they demonstrated to us that they know what they're doing. You know, if people forget in 2006, Hezbollah ran the Israeli Defense Forces out of Lebanon. You know, that 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 was significant because they made the what they did is up to that point, the Israeli Defense Forces were seen as invincible in that region. And I think that really has a lot to do with how inspired a lot of what's happening today is. You can say what you want about Hamas. Like my thing, like people, I was at a meeting the other day and people are like, well, we don't want to support Hamas. I'm like, I do. Like, what the hell is wrong with you all? Like, it, you know, if if these people um, uh, are, are, again, storming in your house and tearing your house up, like, like Malcolm X said, extreme conditions demand extreme solutions. So I think that's the first part of it. And then the, in terms of the AAPRP, our primary role right now is to educate our people around this question. And we do that in any number of ways. We do that with sessions like this. We do that with actions. But I think the primary thing we need to do, and for those of you that don't know, that's a lot of the work we're doing. We, we participate. We've helped organize anti-Zionist actions and activities all over Africa. The APRP has done all over this backward cesspool, everywhere we are, Canada, we do that. And so this is our role because African people, you know, a lot of how this country goes is based on how we go. We don't understand that, but it's true. If you look at it, history, you know, Kwame Ture used to say we've civilized this country. And, and to a large extent, that's true. We're not the only ones. I think indigenous people have done it too. But I think that we have a role to play. Once we get a proper position on something, we have demonstrated that we will choose justice. Um, well, I should say, I meant to say, once we get a proper understanding of an issue, we will come out on the side of justice. And even now, even though, you know, political education is uneven, uh, we still are largely, mostly uh, in proportion to our numbers, uh, largely in support of the Palestinian question, more so than a lot of people. You know, so I think our the best thing we can do to support the Palestinian struggle for self-determination is educate the African masses about it. Because as Africans on the continent get more understanding about this, we can do work to shut down Zionist operations all over Africa, because they're all over Africa. We can shut all that down. We can shut it down here. We can do so much to disrupt their ability to function, but we have to have a conscious population in order to make that happen. And so what are some tools for political education that you suggest, especially in places where people are prioritizing mobilization without organization? Yeah, so I, you know, I think it has to be a decision that we make that we have to study. You know, so if you, if you see that, if you're like, yeah, this is missing, I need to have it, then you can reach out to us. Like I, I'll volunteer, say publicly, I'll help you. If you're serious, you have an organization, you want a political education process, we will help you put that in place. We do that for organizations outside of the APRP. I just helped the organization establish, it was a white organization, established one. They want a study group. They're reading the world in Africa right now. Uh, um, by W.B. Du Bois. So we will do that. This is just how important this is. But don't waste our time because we're busy. Like, don't, don't, wait. you know, if you if, if you were like, hey, I want to do this, it's just me. 
I got maybe one other person. That's fine. But don't be like, yeah, I want to do this. And then, you know, we set a meeting and you don't show up. Don't we, we don't have time for nonsense. We're trying to get work done. But if you're serious, then, yeah, we'll help you if you need help. But the important thing is that even if you start with just saying, OK, in our meetings, we're going to have 30 minutes where we read an article before we do any other business. That's a good start. And you can build up to reading books. That is wonderful. If you do that every time, I guarantee you, if you do that, even just a two page article, every meeting you have six months into that, you will start to see the difference. People, the way people understand the world and how they articulate things will change dramatically for the better. Um, so this question, I want to like, I want to reframe it a little. So the, the comrade is asking um, that we've seen like mass mobilization all over the world for in solidarity with Palestine in opposition to the genocide that Israel and Zionism are carrying out in genocide since October 7th. Um, and we also know at the same time that the African continent is on fire with resistance in the Sahel with the formation of the uh, Alliance of Sahelian States um, in Guinea-Bissau, where they are fighting, like the, the progressive people's movement is like fighting to take power after winning an election. And the reactionaries are keeping them out of office. Um, we are seeing movements and uh, 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 against imperialism and for justice all over Africa. And we are also seeing con like escalating exploitation in places like the Congo and Sudan that are not getting as much visibility. And so how can we make connections between the anti-Zionist movement and the resistance and uprising and exploitations that's happening in Africa? How can we get these kinds of mobilization and this kind of like focus and organizing efforts um, shared with what's happening in Africa? Yeah, so, you know, you know what the answer to that question is going to be that we got it like in the APRP. This is an easy question for us to answer. The Congo is one of the places that's exploited for the diamonds, the uranium, and the things that the Zionist state of Israel uses. And the whole problem in the Congo right now is that there's this push for control and access to these resources. There are 125 militias currently fighting in the Congo. You know, and this is because they're trying to steal these resources. And a lot of these militias are coming in through Rwanda. Like I know a lot of people, oh, Paul Kagame, because you know, Rwanda is suddenly out of nowhere become the preferable place to visit in Africa because they've had all this development there. Some of the best hotels. I have a friend that took his family there. They had these five-star hotels in Kigali. And so everybody's trying to get to Rwanda. That's great. But you got to look under the surface. And under the surface is that these people are doing these things to gain control of these resources. And these resources are being utilized by the Zionist state of Israel. That's the whole reason behind AFRICOM, right? The 100 military, US military bases in Africa. They got these Zionist Mossad agents training these police forces all over Africa and Krav Maga, the hand-to-hand -hand takedown, self-defense. And they're doing all this because they're trying to steal these resources. So there's a clear connection there's no question about that. So for us, it's not just, yeah, we want to get people out. We want to get people to understand it. But it's not just that. It's also we want to organize our people into a fighting force that can sustain our struggle so that we can drive these people out of Africa and create self-sufficiency for African people and at the same time assist the Palestinian people assist the all the other people struggling you know if we if we accomplish pan-africanism when we accomplish pan-africanism you think america's going to be what it is right now and american wealth is built on exploiting african resource there's no way all of these people you know i ain't no african they're gonna be trying to steal my ticket to africa out of my hand so they can get there once this place is, doesn't have that the indigenous people will build it up but these people i'm talking about ain't interested in that they just want to identify with the wealth right now without doing any work so that's what it is for us we have to you know do this work the way we've talked about it but we also have to you know we're revolutionaries so you ask us we have to answer with a revolutionary answer we got to get people engaged in organizing work mobilizing work is great all of us came here through mobilizing work. All of us did. But the next step is organizing work. Where And I noticed for a lot of people who are in mobilizing work, 
that's a difficult transition for them because in mobilizing work, like if you're in Black Lives Matter work, a lot of that is centered around you. You're the personality. You're the one the media wants to interview. You're all that. And you're not going to get none of that in organizing, revolutionary organizing work. You, it's all you by yourself. People, you're going to organize, put all your heart and energy into something and nobody's going to show up and you're not going to, you're going to spend your money and nothing's going to happen and you just keep going. And eventually you begin to have those victories, but you have to be, have your own internal dynamism to do revolutionary organizing work. But that's what we need. That's the only way we're going to get free. Mobilizing work has never freed anybody. You can't point one place in the world where people got free by mobilizing and having rallies and marches. There has to be another component to that. The Cuban revolution had plenty of rallies in the cities, in Santa Clara, in Trinidad, in Santiago, in Havana. They had plenty of rallies, but they had an organized effort that was a part of their guerrilla war with their overall strategy being to have revolution and drive the reactionaries out of the country. So we have to have people who are committed to doing that same type of work. And in the all African People's Revolutionary Party, that's what we're calling on people, African people to do, to join us and help us build up that capacity. Thanks, Sajangu. And if you are African and interested in joining the APRP, we dropped the link to our website and our interest form in the chat. So please check that out. But really, really appreciate that answer. First of all, understanding that there is not like a competition or a dichotomy between solidarity with Palestine and showing up for Africa. That is, is we are fighting a global beast on many different fronts with tentacles everywhere. Like uh, whenever I speak at Palestine Solidarity Rallies here in Florida, I always, always, always point out precisely what Adama explained, that one of Israel's primary exports is diamonds, and there are no diamond mines in occupied Palestine because those diamonds have been stolen from Africa. That Israel funds the genocide of Palestinians with resources stolen from Africa. That Israel has spied on and attempted to destabilize African liberation movements in Africa and in the diaspora. So there are clear at the fact that U.S. police and police forces all over the Western Hemisphere are trained by the IDF. There are clear connections because it's the same enemy that we are fighting globally on many, many different fronts. And it's on us as revolutionary Pan-Africanists, as organizers, to make those connections with people, to understand that every time we're speaking for Palestine, every time we're speaking for Africa, that we have to make those connections. And also always deeply appreciate you uplifting the necessity of building revolutionary organization not just showing up for marches, but joining or forming organizations fighting for justice, raising the consciousness of the people in our community, recruiting them into the organization so they become revolutionaries, because we have to build that fighting force, like Ajamu said. We have to recognize this enemy is not going to go down just because we yell at it. It's only going to go down if we are have superior organization and a clear strategy to defeat it and build something better. So we're gonna we're coming to the close of our webinar. We have about 10 minutes left. And Ajama, I just want to um, open the floor for you for any last remarks you want to make, anything you want to plug, like your program, for example. Um, yeah. Oh, OK. So I'll just say quickly, you all, that um, you know when we talked about the Western Hemisphere, um, some years ago at African Liberation Day, uh, one of the representatives for the American Indian Movement, she she got on the microphone, Andrea Carmen is her name. She got on the microphone and she said, you know, people were at that time, they were like, U.S. out of South Africa. And she said, U.S. out of the U.S. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's the mentality we have to have. I say it all the time. I've said it at the Palestinian rallies I've spoke at, you know, uh, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, U.S. out of the U.S., and all of that, all of that is important that we we link the whole thing. It's not just one thing. It's not a specialized thing. It's the whole thing. And I think that was one of the failures of the anti-apartheid movement, which was a mobilization movement, was that it just focused on that and the, the connections to the Zionist movement and to settler colonialism in this hemisphere were, were not clearly made by too many people outside of our organization and a few others. So we need to do a better job with that today to link all of these struggles to what's happening. And I think that's a critical thing to make our movement stronger. And in terms of, um, you know, we have a lot of programs in the APRP that you should check out. You can go to our website, www.abetterworld.me. I'm sorry, not for that. 
www-aaprp-intl.org. aaprp-intl.org. That's how you learn more about the AAPRP to join. But we just want to make sure we're not trying to don't 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 leave your say that all they want to do is recruit. We don't care. Like, look, I'm a lot of y'all. I don't want. I don't. You don't need to be it because this this organization. You got to work. You got to study, and you're not willing to do that. So don't. We don't want you wasting our time. So don't think that all we're trying to do is recruit. We're just saying you got to do something. You got to do something. So the Black Alliance for Peace is one of the co-sponsors of this. Join BAP. Join the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Join the. These Negroes been talking for two hours organization. Start that organization. And whatever you got to do, just that's what you got to do something. That's that's our, if you leave here with nothing else, that's our message today. So we know that uh, once we start to internalize that message, our road to freedom will be much easier. But, you know, we have the program we do on Sundays, Our Ancestors Voices. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, this Sunday, every Sunday, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time, um, we have the program. And my daughter and I, who's also an AAPRP member, we do it. And we participate. And this Sunday, our topic is going to be the attacks against African women. It's all connected, you all. Like there's, uh, on social media, there's all these attacks. African women are blamed for everything from, from uh, uh from poverty in Africa to why our relationships struggle, all these things, and we're disrupting that whole nonsense right away. Now, now you got us European women on social media talking about, I'm here for you, and that's a damn lie. When has that ever been true? So, you know, a lot of us fall for that, but, you know, we got to wake up in 2024 and beyond. So that's that. Appreciate all of you. Join an organization. Much Ajamu. We are now going to bring our webinar to a close. Thank you all for spending two hours with us on a Tuesday evening to learn about the clear difference between anti or Judaism and Zionism. Thank you to all the folks who have participated in this webinar series, all four hours of webinars. Thank you to all of the speakers, our comrade Ajamu Umi, of course, Nick Estes of the Red Nation, Professor Tanzin Doha. Jamila Bourdon, my comrade in the APRP, and Mark Fancher, another comrade in the APRP. Jamila is also part of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Can't forget the AJBRU. We also want to thank and acknowledge the sponsors and co-organizers of this webinar. Shout out to Isra Ibrahim of the South Florida Coalition for Palestine, who helped, who played a huge role in organizing the series, and who actually, it's like, it was her idea, y'all. The only reason we're here is because Isra came to us and was like, can we do a series? And we put it together. So shout out to Isra and the South Florida Coalition for Palestine. Shout out to our sponsors. I just put all the links in the chat. That is the Black Alliance for Peace. Check them out at blackallianceforpeace.com. Al Adwa, the Palestinian Right to Return Coalition at adwa.palestine.org. Students for Justin in Palestine at nationalsjp.org and the Hood Communist blog at hoodcommunist.org. Please visit those links. Please share those links. This entire webinar series has been streamed to the APRP International YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it again, any of the webinars, including tonight's, or if you would like to share them with folks who couldn't make it tonight, check them out on YouTube. The link is in the chat. And just to want to reiterate that the reason why we did this webinar series is because we greatly support the mass mobilization that is happening in solidarity with Palestine all over the world. But we also understand that mobilization is not enough. We need organization on a mass scale to build a fighting force of poor and oppressed and working class and colonized people who can contend for power and take on the imperialist system and defeat it from Palestine to the Congo to Orlando. And the only way we are going to build that organized fighting force is through political education, is through consciousness building. And so this is what this webinar series was about. We wanted to give some clarity to the resistance that's happening right now. We want to heighten the level of struggle that's happening right now. And we want to inject an anti-imperialist and anti-colonial analysis into mobilization for Palestine. And so we are very, very grateful for y'all for joining us, for participating, for your questions. Thank you so much. So like Ajamu said, if you are not active in an organization fighting for justice, we need you in the fight 
comrade. Get off the sidelines, get into the struggle, join an organization fighting for justice. If the organization you want to see does not exist, then start an organization fighting for justice. You don't need degrees. You don't need grant funding. You don't need special training. You just need a couple of comrades and a shared mission, a shared desire to make change in your community. But we need every, every single person fighting for justice, active in political organizations, because we are fighting the most organized enemy that has ever existed in the form of the capitalist and imperialist system. And we will only defeat that enemy with superior organization. So our concluding comments are join an organization fighting for justice. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.